So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, James. Uh, it is such an incredible honor and a pleasure to be with you all again this Sunday. So, you know, um, guys, although I don a lot of different hats, uh, as James mentioned, a speaker, an activist, an advocate, a co-author, or what have you, but you know, the one that I hold closest to my heart is a peacemonger. Now, I'm sure you guys are thinking, we've heard of a warmonger, but never a peacemonger, right? Well, that's because I coined that phrase. So, you know, guys, as a peacemonger, basically what I do is I fiercely promote social harmony by building bridges of understanding between communities through empathy. But here's the catch. You know, you cannot be compassionate towards others unless you practice self-compassion first, as self-love is the gateway to empathy. So as a peacemonger, I promote peace first within and then without. You know, after all, um, as the Sufi poet and Islamic scholar, Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi once said, this outward spring and garden is a reflection of the inward garden. So all change begins within. Now, you know, guys, I always tell people, and I know James and uh, Tay would agree with that. I always tell people that let's focus on becoming a better person, you know, because once you do that, then you automatically become better uh, speakers or leaders or parents or partners or professionals or what have you, right? So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you lots and lots of stories. And through these stories, I'm going to reveal what it takes to become a better person. Okay, I'm going to admit, get somebody, somebody's in the waiting room, so let me get them in. Oh, okay. Awesome. So here's a story that I recently heard that um, I'm going to share with you first. You know, there was once a student of knowledge uh, from the West who grew up listening to exotic stories about Eastern mystics, and he always longed to meet one someday. So when he finally retired at the age of 60, he decided to tour the world. Now, upon reaching India, he shared his desire with the locals. And they said, go up so-and-so mountain and sitting outside the cave, you will find the sage that you're looking for. So the man found the mountain. And then he huffed and he puffed and he huffed and he puffed and he finally made it to the top. And lo and behold, there sat the sage with his eyes closed and blissed out. So the man approached the sage. May I ask you a question? The sage replied, by all means. So the man asked, what is life? The sage replied, life? Life is like the fragrance of a jasmine upon the gentle spring breeze. The fragrance of a jasmine? The man protested. But my teacher taught me that life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, if you stand, it hurts. If you sit, it hurts. If you lie down, it hurts. The sage smiled wisely and said, well, that's his life. <laughs> uh, so you see, guys, our attitudes influence our reality. If we choose to see things in a positive light, we experience an exuberant existence. As one of my favorite philosophers, whom I often quote, the Sufi poet Khalil Gibran says, your living is determined not so much by what life brings to you, but by the attitudes you bring to life. Now, every setback offers new opportunities depending on our attitude. For example, you know, despite being on partial lockdown for almost a year now, yep, I can't begin to tell you guys how grateful I am for this opportunity to be able to build this global community of Awake Aligned Act with you, with everyone, 
and to be able to spend every Sunday morning with you all, which perhaps I would have never thought of, uh, you know, to or um, made time for under normal circumstances. So I, you know, so despite uh, COVID-19, I am extremely grateful for this opportunity. Now, you know, guys, um, I never start my day without my morning coffee. In fact, I have mine right here. <laughs> How many of you guys love coffee? Raise your hand. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Imagine, guys, that you just entered your favorite coffee shop, okay? Just imagine. And um, you can smell the aroma of fresh coffee beans in the air. Now you start walking up to the register, all smiles, and then suddenly you see a face grouchier than the Grinch. You know, the barista who makes cappuccino at my neighborhood cafe, he always smiles and he greets everyone in the queue until it's my turn. Yep. And then suddenly his face turns to stone. No greeting and eyes glaring, you know, like he's grinding my soul along with the coffee beans. You know, who does he remind me of? Um, the soup Nazi from Seinfeld. Do you guys remember the guy? No soup for you. <laughs> that guy. You know, I'm sure it's the hijab. That's what I used to think all the time. As uh, I've experienced such an attitude before, especially post 9-11 Islamophobia. Now, uh, you know, earlier in such situations, I'd um, get upset or I'd get really angry or frustrated or offended. And my knee-jerk reactions, let me just let somebody in. And my knee-jerk reaction would have been to confront that person, you know, or to fight or whatever. But all of that changed a few years ago. Now, what happened a few years ago? You know, I was in Chicago, my hometown, uh, visiting my family as I do every summer. And uh, it was one of those uh, sweaty, sultry summer days in the Windy City. And I promised my boys and my nephews that I'd take them to the park where they could run around as much as they wanted. But first they needed to accompany me to a store as I needed to pick up some much needed items. Now, I remember um, walking into the store looking like a mama goose with all five boys trailing behind me like a row of ducklings. Now, Ibrahim, my youngest nephew, uh, my sister-in-law is probably on Zoom right now. So her son, my brother's son, uh, so my youngest nephew, he was wearing his superhero cape that day you know, just in case he needed to save all the women from overspending. Now, as I pushed my cart along, you know, uh, suddenly I got this eerie feeling that I was being watched. Has anyone ever felt like that? Letting somebody in? Okay, anyone raise your hand. Have you ever felt like that? Okay. Now for all those who didn't raise their hands are clearly the ones stalking, isn't it? So, you know, I noticed an employee at a distance and she was staring straight at us. Now, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable, but then I thought to myself, I'm sure it's nothing. And then I just continued shopping. Now, Idris, my younger son, he accidentally stepped on a plush toy that was lying on the floor. Within seconds, the employee came rushing towards us and yelled, don't step on that. I said, I'm so sorry, it was an accident. She said, no, it wasn't. I saw the whole thing. I turned to Idris and I said, my love, can you please be careful? And then the employee stomped away, hands clenched at her side. Now seeing my face turn red from anxiety, my older son Jibril got scared. You know, suddenly my mind was flooded by memories of post 9-11 Islamophobic attacks. You know, back then, my face would turn red from humiliation when people would curse at me in public places, yelling hurtful words like terrorist and get out of my country. Now, although this employee's reaction, her behavior triggered that reaction, I still comforted Jibril and I said, don't worry, I'm okay, really. 
She's probably just having a bad day, my love. But I wasn't okay. I felt horrible for not standing up for my child. I was ashamed that my kids had witnessed their mom being weak. I feared that they'd never know how to defend themselves when bullied. Have you guys ever regretted being taken advantage of? Hmm? Or worse, being a bad role model to your kids? Yeah. You know, feelings of guilt and shame swept over me. I was angry at that lady, but I was angrier at myself. But I didn't want my kids to see my inner conflict. So I just continued shopping. Now, as I meandered around the store, I noticed that same employee still staring at us with a disgusted look on her face. Now I'm thinking to myself, come on, man. Is a hijabi woman the only target you can find? Now, right then, my nephew, Ibrahim, he started to untie his superhero cape. And then he dropped it on the floor, complaining, my neck hurts. I look up and I see the same employee barreling towards us. She grabbed the cape furiously. I said, it doesn't belong to the store, it belongs to the child. Frustrated, she flung the cape back down and stomped away, grumbling under her breath. As I watched my kids stare at me with wide eyes, I thought to myself, that's it, I am not going to take this anymore. So I followed her and I confronted her about her attitude. I said, you've been following us and you've been staring at us in disgust? You yelled at my son, I stayed quiet. But now you're throwing the other kids a cape on the floor? What is your problem? She turned around and screeched, your kids are animals. I yelled, how dare you talk about my kids like that? I want to speak to your manager right now. We both shouted even louder and the conflict escalated. You know, guys, at that time, I don't recall what other names she was calling me and my kids, but my heart was pounding so hard from both anger and anxiety that I felt like it would break through my chest. I kept thinking to myself, don't be weak. Don't let her intimidate you. The kids are watching. Now, fuming, she walked away and she disappeared into the employee's only room. I called another clerk and I demanded that she summon the manager, insisting that I won't leave the store until that employee had admitted appalling behavior and apologized. Now the clerk went to get the manager, but then she came back saying that he was busy. I'll wait, I said. And then I turned to my kids and I told them to stand quietly beside me. No talking, no laughing, no nothing. I instructed them. Can you imagine? I was ordering these little boys to behave like adults. But what could I do? I didn't want to give credence to the notion that my kids are animals. I waited. 10, 15, 20 minutes went by and still no manager. But I wasn't going to let go that easily. So I asked, the complaint, I asked for the complaint center number. And then I took my phone and then I put it on speaker so that my, all my kids could hear the conversation. And then I explained the entire incident to the complaint department, demanding that swift action be taken against that lady. Now the complaint manager apologized profusely and assured me that disciplinary action would be taken. And then he also said that he'd call me back after he had spoken to that employee. So I thanked him for being proactive. And then I turned to my kids and I said to them, see how I handled it? Don't ever be weak. Don't ever be scared. And don't ever let anyone walk all over you. You know, I felt good about how I'd handled the situation. I finally felt like 
I was being a good role model to the kids. And then a week passed and I still didn't receive a call from that complaint department. I started to wonder, did he even do what he had promised? Was that employee even held accountable? Did anything change? And then the following week, I went back to back home to Los Angeles with my kids. And then I just got busy in my routine, you know. But then every now and then when that store incident popped in my head, I'd wonder, could I have done anything differently? And then one day during my weekly sessions with uh, my, one of my teachers from Brahma Kumaris, actually speaking of Brahma Kumaris uh, guys, you know, I am an ardent student of Eastern philosophy. So having studied uh, from uh, a couple of teachers from Brahma Kumaris Institute to the University of Sufism and to now studying Vedanta. So I know we have a few Indians uh, on Zoom today, so they know what I'm talking about. So as you know, as most of you here on Zoom already know that I come from a devout Muslim family and you know, my faith encourages me to study all faiths. So amongst others, I'm currently studying Advaita Vedanta as I was mentioning to James uh, earlier. And you know guys, um, since Tay spoke about politics and uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the anxiety and tension because of all of that, you know, I would encourage you to consider studying other religions, to consider studying Islam as well, as this is the only way for us to understand and to appreciate each other's wisdom and traditions and perspectives. And this is the only way for us to recognize our similarities and to embrace our differences. Otherwise, you know, we will always be easily influenced by politicians spewing hate and divisiveness with their us versus them propaganda. Now, surely in the deepest desires of heart and mind, we are all the same, isn't it? Anyway, so going back to my story, as I was mentioning, you know, when I was sharing my emotional blockages with my teachers from Brahma Kumar, with my teacher, from Brahma Kumaris, I mentioned the store incident to her. And obviously I was expecting her sympathy for the way I was treated and validation for the way I um, handled the situation. But then my teacher listened very patiently, you know, without even uttering a word. And when I was done, she shared something completely unexpected something that was taught to her by her teachers. She said, when someone throws negativity at you, you have three choices, absorb, reflect, or transform. And that is the art of attitude, the ability to choose one's demeanor in any situation. Now, you know, her words bounced around in my head all week. I kept wondering, A-R-T, absorb, reflect, transform. Did I really have three choices? And then one day I finally realized that the wisdom of her advice, you know, when I was initial, when I had initially remained quiet during that store incident, I was internalizing my pain by blaming myself for being weak and not fighting back. Now, when we absorb negativity, it hurts us because their words or behavior trigger an already deeply seated insecurity in us. For example, in my case, I have long believed that I'm weak. Now in someone else's case, it could be um, I'm ugly or I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. 
Now, when I finally mustered the courage to fight back, you know, even though I felt, I believed that my reaction was justified at that moment, I reflected the same negative behavior that had me upset. You know, guys, if someone wrongs us through their words or actions, it feels normal and natural to get angry, right? Or to get upset or, or to get offended, isn't it? Because that is our knee-jerk emotional reaction, right? In fact, you know, we may even, it, may ev um, it may even reassure us that we are courageous enough to stand up to such people. But does that momentary reassurance help us or does it hurt us in the long run? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Let me give you an example. You know, if I were to throw um, a burning hot coal at someone, whose hand would get burned first? Mine, isn't it? Similarly, in order to fight back, those negative unpleasant emotions like anger, they have to be aroused in us, which means we experience them first. They affect us before they reach their target. So is it worth it? Even if the other person deserves it? Even if the other person started it? You know, just like philosopher Epictetus once said, anyone capable of angering you becomes your master because he can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him. Now, I thought that I was being a good role model for, you know, for the boys by being strong and by fighting back. But what I landed up showing them is that we are so weak that we have no control over our reactions because our emotions fluctuate based on others' behavior towards us. If they are kind to us, we feel good. If they are mean to us, we feel angry, we feel hurt, we feel humiliated, offended, and the list of negative emotions can go on. So when our temperament is nurtured or inflamed by the environment, we are held hostage. We become prisoners of others' emotional caprices. Now today, you know, people are strongly inclined to fight anger with anger, hate with hate, vitriol with vitriol, and thus continually reflecting each other's behavior, perceiving that to be strength. But when we outsource all of our hurt to others by saying that we reacted negatively only because of what they said or what they did, then we empower them to dictate our reactions. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with standing up for what's right, okay? There's nothing wrong in that. But it is the way that we do it that distinguishes strength from weakness. Now, for example, in my case, okay, I needed to dig deep and ask myself, what outcome did I want out of that store incident? I know that, you know, I wanted that lady to never treat anyone like that again. Now, bad actions should have consequences. Yet, fighting back with fear, with intimidation, with punishment, that does not create any meaningful or lasting change in another person's behavior, let alone the negative feelings that may have to, they, they may have towards us. Now, you know, guys, if I had changed my attitude, instead of reacting by reflecting, if I had remained calm and composed, irrespective of her negative behavior, and if I had responded positively with kindness, with patience and respect, maybe, just maybe she would have realized that her actions were out of line. 
Maybe she would have stopped her aggression toward me or at least brought it down a notch. After all, it takes two for a conflict to thrive. You know, just like water, can permeate the hardest of rocks despite the softest property. Persistent softness is needed to penetrate the hardest of hearts to transform them. And remaining calm and being polite in the face of anger and vitriol is not easy. It requires strength. It requires us to declare our emotional independence from the words and actions of others. Now, like the barista at my favorite neighborhood cafe, who always glares and grumbles while taking my order. Now, earlier, I would have absorbed or I would have reflected his negativity. But this is what I started to do. Whenever I felt an impulse to react, I'd leave. And then one day I decided to have muster up the courage to practice a little bit of emotional independence. So what I did was I not only smiled and uh, when I reached the counter, but I also swallowed my pride and said hello as he ignored my greeting. And then I tossed in a have a nice day before leaving. You know, guys, um, the inherent quality of a rose is that it radiates beauty and fragrance, isn't it? You know, whether it is uh, given to celebrate the birth or commemorate the death of a loved one, right? Now, just like the rose, we all have such beautiful innate qualities like love, like peace, like joy, like kindness. And yet one bad behavior from the other and we let go of our innate beauty and we absorb or reflect the ugliness. Now the next time I visited the coffee shop, I was feeling frisky. So I threw in a, so how's your day going? And guess what? The soup Nazi returned the smile and said, not bad, how about you? And we even exchanged a few pleasantries. And before I could deliver my parting line, he beat me to the punch by saying, have a nice day. So you see, guys, when the qualities that we radiate are not dependent on the other person's behavior, then our persistent softness can penetrate the hardest of hearts and transform them. Now, the barista and I are never going to be bosom buddies. <laughs> but that summer, my teacher taught me something very valuable. She made me realize that in a world where we crave freedom, liberation, independence, we are too often emotionally dependent. Just think about it. If anyone can make us happy, can make us upset, can make us angry, it means that we are trapped in a state of emotional slavery. Our declaration of emotional independence is at the heart of transforming others. And once we become emotionally independent, guess what? We can tolerate any temperament because our inner tranquility is inviolate. You know, when I think of people who exemplified emotional independence, two names stick out. Now, other than James and Tay, two other names stick out. Nelson Mandela and Viktor Frankl. You know, did you guys know that uh, during Nelson Mandela's imprisonment on Robben Island, every Thursday, the prison guards would take him outside and they would have him dig a trench six feet deep. And when he was done, the guards would order Mandela to lie down in the ditch and then they would urinate on him. Can you imagine? Years later, when Mandela was... Uh, um, 
was about to be inaugurated as the first president of South Africa, he was asked who'd like, who, whom he'd like to invite to his first formal dinner as president. And guess what he said? The prison guards from Robben Island. You know, after going through such horrors in prison, any ordinary person would have been consumed by thoughts of revenge, isn't it? And yet Mandela had no resentment or anger because he didn't absorb or reflect the negativity. And due to his attitude, he was able to transform the lives of others. Now Mandela's example is also, it also proves that, this is a hard one. It also proves that the source of our suffering is not another's bad behavior, but our inability to tolerate it. You know, we are prisoners of our personalities. Thus, in order to change our experience, we must work on the resistance our personality generates. Now, Viktor Frankl, the second one, did you know that he was stripped of all of earthly possessions and tortured in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II? And yet, due to his optimism, he survived and he helped many others survive. Now, he believed that everything can be taken away from a person except the last human freedom, the ability to choose one's attitude under any circumstances. So you see guys, while we may not be able to control the outer world, situations, people, their actions, their temperament, their personalities or what have you, we have full control of our inner world. And if we can maintain our inner peace despite outside turmoil and by becoming emotionally independent, then it becomes easier to accept people and situations just the way they are. Now this revolution in perception leads to profound liberation because it transfers power from the external world back to ourselves. Now the parable of Buddha and the second arrow arrives as the same truth. Now for those of you who missed uh, my first session, Here's the parable of Buddha. Uh, you know, Buddha once uh, asked a student, if a person is struck by an arrow, is it painful? The student replied, yes, it is. And then Buddha asked, if a person is struck by a second arrow, is it more painful? The student replied, yes, of course. And then Buddha said, in life, we can't always control the first arrow. However, the second arrow is our reaction to the first. And with this second arrow comes the possibility of choice. So you see, we are not hapless or helpless victims of the world rather victims of our projections and imputations, which create the attitudes we bring to the world. And if we choose to see things in a positive light, then instead of a thorn, our lives can indeed be like the fragrance of a jasmine upon the gentle spring breeze. And that, my friends, is the art of attitude the ability to choose one's demeanor in any situation. Just like my favorite philosopher Khalil Gibran said, your living is, not deter is determined not so much by what life brings to you, but by the attitudes you bring to life.